What is up guys, Lord Nick here bringing you another One Piece related video. In this video guys, we are going to be talking about the general question that a lot of people might ask as we are heading into the Nats, which is how do you fix this meta? How do you shift Sakazuki and the color yellow in general? Because Katakuri and Nell are basically interchangeable deck le uh, leaders right now. It's just a preference on what type of style you want. More aggressive leader, more control, or more like survivable leader, I guess. Um... Which route do you prefer? Uh, so how do you fix this? Uh, right now we're seeing that these two decks are the premier two decks in the meta. While Ploofy is also another deck that is there, I don't think people have as much issue with Ploofy. It has some nasty game-winning potential but and some oppressive com combination of cards that it can utilize and uh, kind of stall out your opponent's Dawn if they get multiple Magellans in a row. But that is not necessarily always what they see. I mean, the fact that they're banking on four cards being in their hand all the time also means that they're more susceptible to have swingbacks on them because they're waiting to have a lot of specific cards that are non-counter cards in their hand. So they are they have some negatives to the you know overall over uh, the aggression that they have. Um. So the two decks that generally stand out is kind of more of the meta-defining, meta-warping, and kind of unfun decks in most people's opinions are going to be Sakazuki and primarily Enel, but Katakuri is also in that question. So how do you fix these? This is a question that a lot of my buddies ask, a lot of times stuff that I've been focusing on and uh, thinking about. Uh, so let's kind of start by talking about the cards that are in Sakazuki first as to what cards are the problem cards with Sakazuki. Um, and I, I think it's pretty easy to define that the problem cards is his recursion package. Um, people have issues with all three of these cards, um, because they all represent something that is problematic about the deck. So, uh, Rob Lucci with proper, uh, with the fact that Sakazuki can swing, can consistently get rid of three costs or two, two costs, but then when paired with Hina's can get rid of big characters along with a smaller character quite easily. The fact that you can reduce one five cost down to a one cost with Hina's ability and then use a Sakazuki swing to reduce a three cost to a two cost means that you get rid of a five and a three cost very efficiently for seven dawn and develop two solid bodies in the process. And that's where the problem lies, right? Like, black removal prior to this had not been all that big of a deal. Like, you could develop a body, but you were also getting rid of cards out of your hand. There was a negative to getting rid of your opponent's body. Now we have cards that are enabling us to not have to ruin cards from our hand. They require more cards in our trash, but our efficient removal pieces... <laughs> Efficient statted bodies, right? Like a three cost 5k is a generic body. Yes, it has no counter, and it, but it has a meaningful effect opposed to that no counter. Same thing with Luchi. A 4-6 is an efficient statted body, like is a generic efficient statted body, but it just instead of a counter has a much more powerful effect. So these are power, more powerful than generics by quite a bit and have the stat lines of those generics uh, at the cost of no counter. That's not necessarily a problem. So these two cards had neither had Lucci not been printed this set, nobody would be arguing that Rebecca needs a ban. Yeah, you get Hina, but your removal pieces are clunkier. You have Kobe's, you have you have Sakazuki's. Uh, like you're gonna have cards that require you to dump stuff out of your hand. So no Rob Lucci means the other two cards aren't as powerful. But I, really, arguably, you could hit any card in this combo, and the combo fizzles. The biggest thing is, and from my personal opinion, I think you could get away with banning Hina. The reason you ban Hina, Hina becomes a staple for every black back, uh, deck to come. Gecko Moria for uh, our Perona decks. Like, this is a card that is in every black deck in the next format, stays in Sakazuki. If forever, this will be a staple card now. It's in a set that is very unaccessible, and this is a card that gate keeps this deck a lot of the time. Now, Great Eruption is another card that gate keeps the deck, and is arguably a card that you could remove. 
I think Greater Eruption is less impactful because you can't get them back as easily. There isn't an accessible card in Blue Black for Sakazuki or even Rebecca for that matter, or even for Mono Black cards to get events back from your from your trash. Now, if we see something that allows you to get events back from your trash, maybe that card becomes a problem because it's an event you get back, you play, you draw a card. Like that is problematic if you have ways to recur it, but currently it's not at anywhere near as a problem as a card that you can get back in the state of Hina. Getting her back and making a body that is a threat the next turn as an attacker that your opponent now has to answer every single turn is a problem. Same thing with, with Lucci, and then Rebecca is just the card that does it. So one of the advice pieces that people have said, one of the, the ways that you can fix this is leader locking Rebecca. And while I think that leader locking Rebecca is not a terrible idea, or I would say you have to archetype lock her, personally, to address Rosa Leader, um, which I think currently hadn't really been that big of a deal, but it is now technically becoming, as we're getting new reprint, we're getting, re, uh, like, in the fact that we have two different crocodiles, we have two different Kaidos, we have two different, uh, navy, we have multiple Navy leaders, like, locking things to an archetype, which would be Dressrosa, Navies, uh, CP, um, you, you could easily do this, and it's not nearly as a... It still allows the card to show up in multiple decks. It just limits those decks to those type of leaders. I think that is a solid fix for Rebecca, it, but it guts Sakazuki, right? Like, Sokka needs this type of recursive value, or he is just generically slightly better than some of the other black decks. But even with the blue cards coming next set... I don't know how much better he actively becomes compared to the mono black navy cards. Um, it's still arguable that he would still be a very strong deck, um, but you would probably see him running less of the Hinas, running less Kuzans. He's got to figure out ways to start adding more 2Ks into the deck. You'd see other Dressrosa cards probably showing up, more Bardos showing up. Um, and it, it could fix the deck. It would fix the deck. It's just, it also probably gut the current Sokka deck. And you'd have to see a lot of rebuilding around it. And I think that that's not necessarily good. I think that that is still somewhat problematic. I think the way that you could fix this is you ban Hina. And you, while that's not necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily want to ban cards, right? We want to rata them first and kind of fix it so that they're, they're locked archetypes. I think that is a solid argument, <laughs> but the problem I do have with that argument is that you would see you would see Sakazuki have to reinvent the entire wheel of the deck, and so you're completely destroying the deck. If you get rid of Hina, he has to find a replacement piece that is a cost reducer in that slot, um, and I think that that's slightly better. Like he'd probably put in Helmeppos, right? Like the two drop Helmeppos, but the problem is, is it can't get hit by the Rebecca. So finding that three cost cost reducer is the kind of important piece and there's not many options currently for Sakazuki to do that um, there are a couple of them but there's not many on play effect ones so if you hit the Hina it does gut his deck but it also keeps a lot of the tools that are there he still has some of the recursive elements he still has some of the other stuff but also hitting the Hina stops other black decks from being nearly as oppressive in the in the future and forces these decks that we haven't gotten yet to have to be rethought um you could do this generalized ban across the board both in the japanese and the u.s meta of banning the hina it's a more a, and overall it's a card that is harder to get the longer we leave this card in the meta without reprints the harder the more people are not going to find black and accessible color so because rebecca and lucci are more common and more easy to find currently because they're in a more recent set that has been bought to hell and back and I would argue you ban the Hina opposed to restricting the Rebecca to a leader type. I mean, if you restrict her to dress Rosa type, we could see more Rebecca's than Sakazuki's. But like, honestly, you just see you see Rebecca becoming the Sakazuki list. And in many cases, I guess that's better, but it then just unlocks an L and makes an L a bigger problem. So let's move into, let's use that as a segue to go into yellow's issues right now, because I think if we do find a way to make Sokka worse, we also have to make yellow worse. Um, and that's a hard question to answer, because when we look at yellow, there are certain cards that are just problematic cards currently, but they're problematic for different reasons. They're problematic in different deck builds. 
And so we kind of have to go into them a little bit. So Yamato is a problem in a Nell. I think Yamato and most other yellows is not nearly as problematic, maybe in Queen, but in in a Nell, it is a massive problem because of the fact that it just keeps a Nell at three, three cards in life, basically. A Nell has four, you have to hit an L four times every time a Yamato is present. On top of that, it gives a Nell the ability to just be like, I take life all the way down to one consistently, repeatedly, because I have counter. I just hold on to all my counter. I don't play any of my counterable cards. I only swing at your life to chip at you. So if you're still at three or four life, that's not a problem. That means I get to get rid of your mid-game cards pretty consistently by dropping a Nell and I heal or dropping Yamato and I heal. Yamato is a three card swing that also develops a giant body, which in the deck like a Nell is legitimately an actual problem. It is very difficult for any other deck in the format really, other than maybe blues that are running red rocks to efficiently get rid of Yamato. And f a six dawn investment is not necessarily what I would consider an efficient removal. Yes, it costs you one card, but it means you also have no real way of establishing a board state that turn, which is just exactly what yellow wants you to be at. If you're both just dropping one card a turn, but yellow is developing a body while removing the pieces you already have out on the board and healing, yellow is winning, right? Like, oh, I'm eliminating your threats. You have to spend a lot of dawn to eliminate my threats without developing a threat. Now, note, you could use the, the package we just talked about previously to start trying to get rid of Yamato, but that current package is an 8-dawn investment, and it's not enough to get rid of a Yamato. Yamato is a 9-cost. With a 4-cost reduction, you're at 5. With a swing of Sakazuki, you're at 4. You'd still need a Great Eruption or another or, or one of your 2Ks in Suru to reduce her to 3. Like, she's still... Uh, Right, right? Four, five, uh, five, four, two. Okay, so you can reduce her to two with a Suru or a Great Eruption. That's not efficient, like, removing it. Like, Sokka does stink at removing big cards most of the time. And in this scenario, this is where Sokka struggles to deal with this deck. Now, you could do a 10 on investment with a 5k swing at life, plus a Hina and, say, a Borsalino. And now you've established two giant bodies, and that's really good. We still have the problem... That Anel has two life, and you're arguably probably at three life. So that Hina is not living. Yeah, your Borso is not going to die. But if they're really afraid of the Borsalino, what they do the next turn is they just drop a Katakuri, put it to the top of your life. And then they can, if they really don't care about being at one life, if all you have is you and that Hina, they can Thunderbolt that Hina, which puts, you down to, puts them down to one. And you don't have enough attacks to get through that. So you're not even going to swing at that one, which sets them up to heal with Yamato the next turn and clear something for five. It, it's it's a ridiculously consistent way of them being able to deal with stuff. And adding the Katakuris on top of it is just a, another problem. Katakuri is the singular most effective, in terms of cost-effective, removal character in the game. Now note, he does put it into life, which is arguably a, a worse way of removing things. But it's also not a worse way of removing things. Because if it is a no counter big end card that costs eight, you're establishing eight dawn, seven or eight dawn to play a giant card that has no counter, and he's now put it to the bottom of your life. There's two big issues with this of like, oh, well, he's healing you. Well, no, that's not necessarily what he's doing. He's locking a card out of your usage, which is one of your top end cards. He's putting a card with no counter as your last one so that there's no way to bank on you getting a good counter, a good a 2K out of there, or getting a good effect out of there because they now know what it is. And on top of that, he's developing a very efficiently statted body. An 8-drop 8 8K is not necessarily the best. Like, we see 7-drop 8Ks all the time. But an 8K body is difficult to deal with, and arguably being an 8 cost makes it even harder to deal with because... The only card that can efficiently remove an 8 cost for, for one for one is a Katakuri. So the only card that removes Katakuri efficiently is the card itself. So if you're not running yellow, you have to use multiple cards to deal with this guy, but they have one card that can deal with basically everything. That's not okay. On top of that, he has the versatility to heal you some cards. So if you have like a Shirahoshi on there, you can put a Shirahoshi to the top of your life. Now, while your opponent can swing at it, you don't have to worry about if you get a trigger or not, because now you have an efficient trigger that's going to draw you three cards and let you trash two dead cards in your hand. And 
all of a sudden you now have card advantage and maybe you drop another category the next turn heal yourself back up swing with the 8k that you have you are establishing dominant boards preventing your opponent from getting meaningful damage into your life because you are consistently getting 2k counters into your hand to be able to stop them from getting past that one sheer hoshi if you want and you're developing giant bodies so outside of just being the most efficient removal piece he's one of the most efficient heal pieces as well which makes this a massive issue with dealing with yellow. They have all of the pieces for healing, which is fine. Having a color that is more of a heal-centric color is perfectly fine. The big problem is, is we are kind of leaning towards like the worst parts of security control from Digimon. If for those that don't understand that reference, Digimon has an archetype similar to this called uh, called that was called security control. The difference is, is in Digimon, you're not locked to one color because you're not a leader game. So you would be in yellow and you can't play those cards unless you have a Digimon on the board that is of the same color. But if it comes out of life, you can use its trigger ability. And so what they would do is they'd have all these cards that are just the best uh, removal event uh, equivalents of events in uh, that have the best like trigger event removal um, in the game. You put them into your life or they draw you cards or whatever they do. And then you you just use your yellow cards to just stack your life with these cards. And if you draw them, you basically would just use cards that allow you to put them back on top of your deck so that you could stack it immediately. Or ones that allow you to look at your life, take a card, put a card from your hand into your life. And so you just stack your life with some of the best cards there is. Yellow is starting to move towards that. And while it's more RNG aspect, when... About half of their deck, about 25 cards on average in most yellow decks are trigger effects and they're meaningful trigger effects. You you run into an issue that, oh, there's not that much RNG to it because as long as you draw the rest of the cards that are not that, pretty much guaranteeing every card is going to end up being a trigger and it's meaningful because it either develops a body on your opponent's turn, which is difficult for them to deal with, or it starts stopping their attacks or it heals you, or it draws you cards, which are all impactful, like super impactful things. If you're stuck on cards and all of a sudden the two the two triggers out of your life are a uh, are the are the Sky Island Searcher and a Shirahoshi, well, you've just fixed your stuff, right? Like you've just netted a card, you've just netted a card off the Shirahoshi, you've netted a card off of the Searcher, and you develop two bodies while they're not meaningful if your opponent has no life they become meaningful because you can just stock you can just stockpile some dawn on them and swing in um that's a problem and then lastly we have charlotte linlin who is a problem or has been considered a problem um and i think that she becomes a problem when you're able to when you're able to get into a board state where you can actually stack multiple linlins one right after the other she becomes very difficult to deal with because 10 drops are always difficult to deal with. And that should be what 10 drops are. They should be kind of the boss end game monsters. But the problem is, is when they have such meaningful, insane effects like Lin Lin, which is a two life swing, one in your favor, one against your opponent, and then develop a board, uh, board card that is almost impossible to deal with. You run in, you run into issues, you run into some problems here. So what is the solution to yellow and to Sakazuki? Well, Arguably, with with Sakazuki, the uh, the argument was that we we either restrict Rebecca to only dress her as a type, or we ban Hina. With Yellow, I don't think banning the cards is the option. I think that that is a problem. But I think that we can, because of Yellow, we can instigate a rule that is a sweeping rule across all colors. You are limited to so any card that costs eight or more, you are limited to two copies of that card in your deck. And I think that that fixes a lot of the problems because these cards are powerful. Having multiples of them is kind of needed, but being able to stack one right after the other is the problem with all of these cards. If I can play a Yamato into another Yamato, I've now removed two mid-game cards from my opponent, healed myself twice probably, and I am stacking two big-ass bodies repeatedly. Same thing goes with Katakuri. If I Katakuri into Katakuri into Katakuri, I keep putting stuff back into my life. I'm healing constantly or I'm removing big stuff from my opponent while taking away the life that actually matters, the stuff that could be actual triggers. Um, and then with Big Mom, I'm just trashing cards from my opponent and giving myself card advantage while also keeping myself long, uh, uh, 
keeping myself alive longer. And even if they have a way of dealing with this, I have another one. So if we limit all of these eight cost cards to eight cost or higher cards to two of them, this also fixes a lot of problems across the rest of the game, right? If we were to gut yellow and to gut Sakazuki, Whitebeard's back, baby. Like he's just in full power and back, and there's nobody to stop gate him. But if we limit, if we limit top end cards, we also deal with the issues of Whitebeard, Red Purple Luffy. We we it breaks up the consistency of these decks that rely on stacking giant boss monsters every game to win because that, that's just not a good feel there's not a good way to interact with these boss monsters right now you could argue well but cost reduction plus a mihawk gets rid of anything it's like yeah it gets rid of almost everything but you have to bank on two cards to deal with one card when they can just generally deal with most of your cards with one card themselves it it, it is it is a problem and the fact that these decks get away with running Four Yamatos, four Katakuris, two seven drop moms, and two seven drop Anels. You're running so many non counter big cards, and it doesn't matter. Like, that's just how yellow feels right now is they get to run the best top end, they get to run the best mid game, they get to run the most 2Ks, and they get tons of triggers in the process. So, limiting the top end makes them have to reevaluate their strategy. It doesn't necessarily gut their deck, but it does the same thing as taking a Hina out. You have to revisit the strategy. You have to reformulate the strategy. The deck is not necessarily dead, but you really have to redevise how you're going to run it. Now, this could mean that we just see four seven drop moms, and it might need to be extended to seven drops, right? We might have to extend seven to ten drops, but I think eight to ten is the general danger range for most decks in terms of that's when the boss monsters truly begin. But we could argue that, you know, okay, sevens are limited to two as well. So seven to tens, let's say it's seven to tens. I mean, we could really start making top ends have to be more versatile. You're going to have to find different top ends. And if you have to play those, that means that depending on which top end you see, determines the type of end game strategy you have to develop which makes the decks a little bit more difficult to pilot which i think is also somewhat of a needed thing anel yellow in general is a very easy deck to pilot because you're just banking on there being a lot of triggers so you could still play to that regard but not giving them such a punishing top end on top of it saves a lot of other decks the ability to actually play into them so in terms of what does this change this this changes the oppressive just repetitive top end that we see in the current meta it opens up archetypes for other decks who generally kind of have to run multiple different top ends to try to give themselves a, a wider berth a better chance of potentially dealing with stuff like that and what, what kind of decks might that be it might be the, the blue Crocs who don't run as many of the top end cards other than maybe a couple of Mihawks. It allows maybe it maybe allows Queen to kind of swing back into the meta. You can see more red decks kind of swinging back into the meta because they don't abuse the top ends as much. Um, it shifts the meta more to mid range cards because your top end cards are limited to the number of them that each that you can have. So you can't really bank on just having four categories in a deck to see your category all the time. So that means that maybe you have to revisit how many of your mid game cards and how you play the mid game more. So we could see a more mid rangey meta, which a mid range meta is the best meta. It means that we have some long term decks that can do okay. We have some aggro decks that do okay. And the mid range decks are generally king, which is kind of where you want it to be. You want it to be shifted around the fact that we have all the different uh, ranges of win conditions being present in the meta and then it removes repetitive combos we stop we stop the categories from being able to do yamato kata yamato kata to just constantly just remove bigger and bigger things every turn and then on top of that we stop sakazuki from being able to just continuously and repetitively get back hinas to just remove things and constantly do this unfun play style to play into so overall, it shifts the meta into something that should be more enjoyable. The control is not nearly as consistent and dumb repetitiveness. The top end of these stupidly strong mid-range decks are no longer shifting into just being oppressive top ends, and it should open the meta more. And then in terms of card design and format changes for the future, things that we can do, or things that not we can do, but things that the Bandai creators of the game can do, would be to leader lock certain archetypes more strongly, but also in in turn allow these archetypes to be stronger. If they are locked to specific leaders, you can make them stronger because it's only one deck that you're really worrying about. And if that deck starts getting out of hand, it's much easier to be able to be like, oh, okay, this is the card that does it. 
on top of that, you can make more powerful generic cards in the top end because you're not worried about people having four of them in a deck. It opens up the top end design because now they're limited to two. If they're limited to two, oh, okay, well, they're not going to see it as consistently and they're not going to be able to really, it's not going to be very common that they're going to be able to do one right after the other. So you can actually make the top end more powerful and it, it enables you to have some power creep in the game that probably won't creep everything out of the game which is always the difficulty with card design is you want to add in new flashier cooler cards but the design elements of the game kind of limit that right if you have four of those then you're going to see them constantly but if you have two of those in a 50 card deck you're not going to see them all that often you have a one in 25 chance of seeing it it means you have a much better chance of not seeing any of them rather than seeing two of them back to back. So you can make more powerful cards that are not necessarily locked. But those generic cards you can also make into archetypes like Blue Jam Pirates, for instance. Or you can make them into, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, an East Blue, but it's a red card. You start giving them archetypes that aren't necessarily searchable and repeatable and findable. And then you can make them more powerful, which is also another way of fixing some of these things is you start making them less findable. Um, you start adding in more tech cards, more cards that really are very, very niche in their usage. But if a meta starts shifting towards uh, those, uh, what those cards are good against, people have options to swap those cards in. So you don't necessarily make them just generically powerful. You make them very specific. We started seeing this in OPO5 a little, uh, OPO5. A little bit we've had some in the past but you know one of the cards that comes to mind for me is i think it was viola is the name of the card it's either viola or violet i don't remember which one it is but it's the it's the three uh two drop 3k on play your opponent puts three cards from their trash back into their deck that is a tech card for sakazuki that is a tech card against nami these these card these decks that need to either play off of their trash or they need to burn through their deck and if you can do this if you can consistently put these cards back into their deck it makes it more difficult for them to actively win by their win condition so that is a tech card that is an example of a tech card it won't really do anything against everybody else but against these two decks specifically it does something pretty impactful um and then adding in possible set rotations making it not an eternal format i don't see this one being a likely solution and i don't actually personally care if we end up having a set rotation or not having dead leaders being leaders that don't get any play leaders that aren't necessarily doing anything allows for better deck or set designing in the future whereas you can just start designing new cards that go into those decks opposed to having to create new leaders every time we're already kind of getting to the point where we have so many good leaders that some of these eb sets can turn into the ones where it's like well what if we just don't put any leaders in it it's not a draftable set but it's a supplemental set for some of these dead archetypes which is kind of what ebs are supposed to be right so just don't add new leaders to ebs and add in more cards uh, to them to then just to help up some of these dead archetypes which i think is fine and then you don't have to look at set rotation but if they really wanted to visit it you could look at set rotation be it like okay after you could do the magic route after three years of being in the standard rotation the set cycles out and we go into the new ones and maybe you can make some evergreen cards maybe some evergreen mechanics that you can then reprint in sets so that it saves you having to print 200 new cards in a set you just start reprinting some of the some of the other cards that are like hey these are staple cards that we think need to be in here um maybe you can start doing core sets and stuff i mean there's 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 issues with that in and of itself so i mean i don't think rotations is an answer but it is a possible thing that we could see in the future to help kind of shift metas in a more uh it, it, to make sure that metas don't keep staying the same stale meta but it does also require them to have a pulse on what that meta is and start designing cards into future sets that will replace the old sets that changes the meta for the better and not necessarily just shifts it to being like oh this is the dominant card but like more of being aware of okay these are going to be cards in each of these decks these are cards that are strong we know these are strong let's give some of them some support but let's not like over tune it but let's give support across each color um, but for me, I think the bigger things would be to print generic cards that cannot be searched as much while implementing the rule for the top end to just be down to two cards. And then on top of that, leader locking even stronger cards so that it can't be used generically across a color. It can only be used by certain decks, which gives each of those decks kind of a unique feel and a unique archetype to those decks. 
I know this is a bit of a rambly video. I think this was a lot, one of my longest videos that I've done that's just been purely rambling. I hope you guys enjoy it, though, and I hope to see you guys in the next video. And until then, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, guys.